Well, I guess Tim told you there weren't going to be any eggs. Put it this way, no bunny loves you like Jesus. <laughs> you know, I've, we're trying to come up with a new word for resurrection and Easter. I just haven't come up with one. You get one later, you know, maybe just a good hallelujah will do it. Amen. Just praise the Lord. So go ahead and praise the Lord a little bit. It is Easter, you know. It's good to have my family here, Cherish and Todd, and Joseph's here from Fort Bragg and his fiance. This is Jenny Ray, so you all give her a welcome and a praise the Lord. I know some of you have family and friends in. We welcome you to the service today. We're talking about the resurrection. We, in fact, we've been in a series of messages having to do with the cross and the journey to the cross, and maybe should have retitled it Journey to the Resurrection, because that's the way this story concludes the journey to the cross. Five parts. We won't go through all those and rehearse all those today. I'm going to say that you have been here and been a part of it. You know that it's been a step-by-step -step journey from that upper room where Jesus met at Passover evening, where the institution of the Lord's Supper took place, where he washed their feet. We've gone from there to Gethsemane, to the, the trials of Jesus and the arrest and the denials of Judas and the denials of Peter, and all the way up to this place where he's being turned over to the Romans for a final scourging. And then thinking that would be the end of the deal, Pilate presents him back to the, the legal authorities in the religious system, and they want him crucified. And that was their word, crucify, crucify, to which he's turned it over at that point to the Romans to carry out their, their dirty deed of the crucifixion. We preached on that last week. If you didn't get to hear that message, I would encourage you to order that DVD. It's a very inexpensive order, so, uh, but you can order those on the back table because I believe it's probably, that is that message is understood, you'll understand the very heart of the gospel message about what we preach and what, we're, what we are as Christians really all about. It, everything focuses around the cross. Yes, the resurrection, but the resurrection is validating the cross. The resurrection is God saying, I approve of what has been done here, that the acceptable offering for man's sin has been presented and it has been accepted. If God did not accept it, if God did not approve of it, then there would have been no resurrection. We'd be here today with no story to tell, no hope to rejoice, and no songs to sing. In fact, there'd be not really anything to talk about at all. But the resurrection brings about the proof of that God does accept the, the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus Christ for our sins on behalf of our sins. Even though skeptics for centuries have tried to deny the resurrection, it's undeniable. Today, I'm not going to preach about the proofs of the resurrection or the evidences. I've done that in sermons past over the years. We've talked about the legal evidence that could, if you took it to a court today, and some of the greatest books on the resurrection have been written by legal authorities who sought to pretty much put down the whole resurrection story, but who approached it with an open heart and mind and began to study it, and then look at the Bible and the evidences that are presented in the Bible to prove the resurrection, everything from the grave clothes, the empty tomb, to the changed lives, to the people who, who sacrificed their lives to follow the, uh, the evidence for the resurrection is incredible and outstanding. In fact, I believe Lou Wallace was one of the great eternities in history past who sought out to disprove the resurrection, who ended up, in his mind, seeing there's clear evidence in Scripture for the resurrection of Jesus, went on to write a book many of you may be familiar with, or if you didn't read the book, you saw the movie Ben-Hur. So the, tr the proof is there for those who are strong enough to take it, those who are willing enough to take that journey into Scripture and look at the evidences of history and see that Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. He is risen indeed. Amen? I want to talk to you a little bit different approach than that today, and I want to talk to you about uh, what the, uh, the Apostle Paul addresses in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. We're going to be looking the resurrection, and it is so, and if it were not so. In fact, that's the theme that the Apostle takes when he writes to the Corinthian church and he begins to discuss with them about the resurrection and how that we preach Jesus who has been raised from the dead. But if he has not been raised from the dead, then what really is our message that we would share? So let's look at this passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we'll read 12 through 19. It says, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how does some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? And if there is no resurrection of the dead, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain, and your faith also is in vain. Moreover, we're even found to be false witnesses of God, because we testified against God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise up, is in fact the dead are not raised. For if, 
the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless. You're still in your sins. And those who've fallen asleep in Christ, they've perished. If we've hoped in Christ in this life only, then we are of all men most miserable or to be pitied the most, as the way one translation puts it. Basically, what the apostle's doing here, he's saying, listen, there are some people who don't believe in the resurrection. And he was talking about in a broader sense where people didn't believe that there would be a great resurrection one day for the, those saints who've died in the Lord. But he said that, that you know, we have this, this proof of resurrection from Jesus Christ himself. But if you are right, maybe you're just right in your mind. You, you, you think you're right. But if you are right, here's, here's the ultimate outcome. If there is no resurrection of the dead, and then he lists about six things. So I want to look at those six things first of all today, what, if Jesus is not risen. But then I want to show you the fact of the matter, since Jesus is risen, what the truth really is all about. So he starts off as he writes these Corinthian letters, he says, okay, if, if Christ is not risen, what's that, where does that leave us? If there is no resurrection of Jesus from the dead, then, then what, what do we have? It says, first of all, if it's not true, then our preaching is in vain, or our preaching is useless. In other words, for me to get up here today and talk about a Savior, a risen Lord and a Savior, it's really a waste of your time and a waste of my time. If Jesus is not risen. <laughs> I've always been kind of amazed at preachers that I've met over the years who don't believe in the resurrection. You know, I'm thinking, well, what are you doing? <laughs> you know, well, why are you preaching? There's no hope if there's no resurrection. There, there, there's no hell, there's no heaven. I mean, if you don't believe in the resurrection, you know, what's the, what's the use? Well, these are the same guys, by the way, who don't believe in the integrity of Scripture, the inerrancy of, 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 of Scripture. And so, uh, you know, you wonder, why are you even in the ministry? I mean, what are you doing here? And I think some are there just to draw a check, I'm sure. All right? But anyway, if the, if the, if the gospel and you know, message of the risen Savior is not a fact, then everything that we preach and everything that we say is useless and it is in vain. And as well as the world mocks and ridicules preachers today, they might as well go on and continue because they're right if Jesus is not risen. And then he says, uh, you know, if Christ is not risen, then our faith is useless. What's the use? Why are you following Christ? Why are you living a different kind of life? Why are you choosing to be unique for Christ? What's the whole deal? Why are you believing? Because if there's no resurrection from the dead, then Jesus is not raised, and then we have nothing to believe in anyway. He's just another man. Or the fact that God didn't accept the sacrifice of Jesus. It was God raising him up that said, I received that offering that's been made. But if he didn't raise him up, then, you know, our faith is useless. And in fact, he goes on to say, we're a bunch of useless liars. So here we are, we're preaching in vain, it's a, it's a message is a lie, and we're living in vain, so life is vanity, so we're living a lie, we're preaching a lie, so ultimately we're a bunch of useless folks. Now I know the world looks at the church like that anyway. For the most part, the secular world mindset is, you know, the church is a waste of time, those people have lost their mind, and just, you know, another crazy group of people who really don't get what's going on in life, and maybe they're trying to be better people, whatever, but, you know, there, there's just no risen Savior, and there's just no, there's no changing lives, and this transformation stuff, it's all a, it's all a joke, it's useless, and they, their life is useless, and, by the way, what they're preaching is a lie. And he goes on to say, and he just kind of wraps it all up, and saying, we are useless, we're, why are we useless? We're still in our sins. I mean... If Jesus Christ died to take away our sins and to present himself on the altar of God as a holy sacrifice, the Bible says by one man sin entered into the world, all right? Adam sinned, we all became sinners. And it goes on to say, by one man's sacrifice, that's Jesus, the Bible calls him the second Adam, by one man's sacrifice we can be made right with God. We can be made righteous. Our sins can be forgiven. But, you know, if God didn't accept what he did for us, then we're still in our sins. God doesn't vindicate us and, and accept what Jesus did. And if his blood wasn't a holy sacrifice for our sins, the Bible says, remember, the wages of sin is death. The Bible says, without the shedding of blood, there's no removal of our sins. If his shed blood and his sacrifice is not enough, and folks, I got some bad news. You're still bound in your sins. You're still bound, headed for destruction. There is no hope whatsoever. The fifth point he makes, he said, now, if, if it's not true, then those dead people, those, those people who died believing God and trusting Christ, they died, uh, well, you know, their faith, their belief was really a waste of time because, you know, they're still lost. Because what Jesus did wasn't sufficient. What he did didn't, didn't take care of the problem. But we know what he did did take care of the problem, and so their faith was not useless, and they're not off into eternity without hope, without God. Now, the Scripture makes it clear that there is a heaven and there is a hell. I mean, there are some, like Jehovah's Witness, who would prefer to believe that there really isn't a, 
uh, hell, and really heaven is really going to be for a certain amount of people, 144,000, and so, you know, that's kind of, you know, despairing. Remember some Jehovah Witness showed up at my door last year, knocked on the door, and I just kind of went along for a little while. I said, oh, you guys Jehovah Witness? And they, oh, yeah, we're Jehovah Witness. I said, man, if I was going to be anything, that's the last thing I would be. <laughs> well, why do you say that? I said, because only 144,000 of you are going to be saved. And there's probably millions of Jehovah Witness over, you know, since the whole movement started back in 17, 1800s, whenever it started back there. So there's been a lot of Jehovah Witness come down the pike. Do you really think you're going to make it over all those who have gone before you? Well, it got quiet. <laughs> like that. You know, I, I know me, all right. I'm, I'm not going to make the 144,000 cut, all right. <laughs> yeah. I'm just not going to make the cut, all right. There's 7 billion people on the planet. I know there's at least 144,000, a whole lot better off than I am. I'll be honest with myself, all right? But that's not what saves us because we outwork everybody. We're saved by grace, all right? All who come to Christ can freely receive of the gift of life. So those who trusted Christ, you know, the whole witness say that if they did trust, you know, in their particular theology and they went off into eternity and they're not the 144,000, they go into annihilationism. They're just like they never existed, <laughs> gone. But the Bible says God made us a living soul, you know. We're, we are living souls. Inside this vessel is a soul, and that soul is going to live on in eternity. And, and because Christ has died on the cross, and his offering has been made acceptable unto God, and God raised up Jesus from the dead, then I know that when I die, well, praise the Lord, that's not going to end up in uselessness or in no hope. The sixth point he makes here is that if this is not true, if Jesus is not risen, then, you know, you're a miserable person. So he puts it in one translation. You're a person that is to be pitied. Remember Mr. T, pity the poor fool? Yeah. That's you. <laughs> pity. Because you're believing in a message that won't change your life. You have a hope that's not going to make any difference in your life. You're making a commitment to something that's going to be a waste of your, of your time and your energies. Your talents and your skills just being wasted because it's not true. Hey, but I have some news. It is true. And Jesus is risen from the dead. We have witnesses, we have proof, we have, we have history that proves itself, we have written record of witnesses. Hey, Jesus is risen from the dead. Now, since he is risen, everything I've just stated, the preaching's useless, the faith is useless, we're useless, we're liars, we're still in our sins, the dead are wasted their time in trusting, they're lost, and we're to be pitied. That's not reality for us, and that's the point that the apostles is trying to make at this particular point in time. He is risen. If Christ is not risen, that's true. But the truth of the matter is, Christ is risen from the dead. Amen. Hallelujah, you ought to praise the Lord. Which brings us to the positive side of the message. If you were feeling a little tormented there, hold on. Christ is risen from the dead. And because he is risen from the dead, first of all, our preaching is essential. Our preaching is life-changing. We have a message. We have a word that is sure. We have a word that is certain. We're not telling a lie. The message is the truth. Our preaching is important. I know the world looks at preaching and kind of, you know, puts down preaching and teaching and the declaration of the gospel. But, boy, I want you to know God has chosen the method of preaching to save people. 1 Corinthians 1.21. For after that, in the wisdom of of God, that, <clears throat> that the world by wisdom knew not God, it pleased God by the foolishness of preaching to save them that believe. The Bible says that if we don't know Christ, that we're lost, all right? So if we're lost, we need to be found. If we're without Christ, we are in despair. So if we're in despair, someone needs to come along and throw us a lifeline. Someone needs to give us a message of hope. Someone needs to offer deliverance from the despair, from the emptiness, from the vanity of life without God. So here comes Jesus. He is God, but yet he's man. He becomes a sacrifice for our sin. I, I've watched a little bit of one of those old movies on Jesus that came out on, you know, on the History Channel. Just a, I can only take just a few minutes of it. But basically, if you followed the premise of the movie about Jesus, it was that Jesus was a man who became God. Now, you need to understand that Jesus was God before he became a man. And he came to the earth and became a man. He took upon himself the form of man, all right? So here's the message of life. Here's the gospel. God became a man. God was the only one who could make an acceptable sacrifice for our sin. Why? Because you and I are sinners. Our offering is tainted, 
all right, by sin. So God offers this spotless lamb called Jesus on the cross for our sins. He who knew no sin, the apostle says, became sin. that You and I might be made right with God. So we're made right with God. We're made holy before God. So the, the message we preach is a, prime, a primary, it's the most important message in the world today. It's more important than any other message. It's a message of life. It's the message of eternity in heaven and not in hell. And God says, you know, I've chosen this method. He said, well, I don't like preachers and I don't like preaching. Well, neither did I. I used to make preacher jokes all the time. So tell me God doesn't have a sense of humor. <laughs> you know, I couldn't stand preachers, didn't like preachers. And then God said, well, let me just teach you something here, son. And, <laughs> and now our one. The glorious truth is, hey, this is the means. And whether it's a preacher standing in the pulpit or you at your office or you in the park or you at the grocery store, when you deliver this message to someone, you're, doing, you're preaching. It's, it's what it's called. It's caruso in the Greek language. You're de declaring a truth. You're declaring a message. And that's the way that God has chosen to reach the lost world we live in today. I know folks think that they're going to get saved by bunnies and egg drops and all that other stuff, you know, and, Dropping eggs out of helicopters. You know, I thought eggs came from chicken, and now we think they're from rabbits, and now they come out of helicopters. I'm getting confused, all right? <laughs> Egg hunts and church don't come from the same book. So I've had people say, why don't you do an egg hunt? Why don't y'all do the bunny thing? Listen, that's not what Easter's about. That's about Ishtar, the goddess of fertility, all right? There's a difference between Ishtar and the goddess of fertility and the message that we declare of Christ Jesus, risen from the dead, saving and changing lives today. I mean, you can eat all the eggs and chocolate bunnies. It won't change your life. Now, I know some do it. That's their business. It's not my business. But here's the truth of the matter is the message that changes lives is Jesus, and you don't have to trick people to get them to church. You just need to tell them the truth of what God loves and got to change the plans for their life. Titus, Paul writes to Titus, he said, listen, by the way, young preacher, God hath, and this time we're living in now, he's shown his word through preaching. God declares the truth of the gospel, declares the word through preaching, which is committed unto me, that's Paul talking, according to the commandment of God our Savior. So God's called us to share this truth. So we have this, this, this message we share. This is, this is why we're not ashamed to preach it. Paul said in Romans chapter one, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Because it's God's power that leads people to salvation. It's the greatest message in the world. And never will forget, you know, one night I had I'd been to this thing, this Jesus concert, got tricked into coming to it, by the way, and was sitting there after this concert. I got out of there as fast as I could, and I had a date with me. I was still a young, young man without Christ in my life, messed up, and gone to this Jesus concert, got out of there after about the third song, you know, by the way, I was quite inebriated, and by the moment I sat down in that chair and the concert started, I was made the Spirit of God. I mean, I'm not lying. I was completely sober, and I knew everything going on in the moment, and I don't think I'd been that sober in about three years, so it scared me. So I grabbed my date. We made our way to the emergency exit. This was an emergency. <laughs> I'm getting out of this place. I don't want to hear this. I don't want this. I remember going down and sitting over in Bel Air. Party Houston, sitting in one of these little steak and egg places afterwards, sitting there talking to this girl, drinking a cup of coffee, and she said, what was that all about? I said, I got you out of there, don't worry about it. No, what was that all about? And so I started to tell, well, you know, these are Christians, you know, they believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Well, I grew up a Catholic, I believe that, you know. I said, she said, uh, she said uh, so, but what was all that about? I said, well, you know, they believe that if you really understand uh, who Jesus is and you understand who you are, you realize that you're a sinner. I grew up in church, by the way, so I had, you know, I had the message down. I said, you know, you realize that you're a sinner and you need God in your life. And, and the Bible says you must be born again in John 3. And so these people, you know, they, they've made this commitment of their life to Jesus and they're born again. And, uh, and uh, you know, they've been saved. They don't believe they're going to go to hell. They're going to go to heaven. And, and she was asking these questions. And finally, you know, she, she, she looked at me. She said, well, Joe, <clears throat> if you know all that, why aren't you one of them? <laughs> That'll ruin a date real quick. I took her home, <laughs> but it haunted me. If you know all that, why don't you want to? Because the message is the truth. It's just the truth. When you come to Christ and you recognize who you are and you need him and you're without him and you're separated in your sin without him, you know, you give your life to him and he makes a difference in your life. He, he changes your heart. He changes your life. He changes your mind. And your, your whole position is basically changed in life. 
Our preaching is important. The message we have is powerful. The message we have is alive. It can literally go into someone's heart and mind. And it's not like giving a, a, a lecture on history. And it's not like giving a lecture on science or giving some kind of academic speech to a crowd of people. This message is unique. And when it is spoken into hearts and minds, it has the power, as I say, to come in and speak to you and show you the things in your life that are wrong and reveal to you the things that are right and show you that there's light and there's hope. And you don't have to live in emptiness and despair in your life. God can fill that void in your heart and life. So it's important. And Paul's saying, because Christ is risen from the dead, he's given us this message of hope, and our message is life-changing, it's essential. So, but not only that, our faith is not useless. Our faith is important. Christ has risen from the dead. And our faith, if we put it in Christ Jesus, will lead to a changed life and a victorious life, and ultimately to eternal life. 1 John 5 puts it this way. For whosoever, whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. This is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. What's the hope of living? Jesus is. How are you going to get through life? Through Jesus. How are you going to enjoy life? It's through Christ. Where do you find peace in such a despairing, empty world that offers no answers and has no hope? It's in Christ Jesus. And because he's risen from the dead, the message is real and the life is real. And because of that, we have eternal life. First Peter says, we receive to the end of our faith. Where's it all leading that I've trusted Christ? Ultimately, the salvation of my soul. Because of the message of the gospel, because of what Christ has accomplished, and because of the, the hope that we have in Christ, not only do I have hope now, the Bible says in this life right now, Jesus, I will give you peace. But listen, it leads to life and life eternal. And by the way, the moment you do commit your heart to Christ, eternal life moves in. The presence of God comes into you. It's what it means to be born of the Spirit, to be born again. You've opened up your life. You've welcomed Christ into your life. You've welcomed God into your life, His truth into your life, and life begins at that point. And by the way, the Bible says that if we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, that we shall be saved, all right? What's the passage in John 3, 16? For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him shall have eternal life. When does that begin? That began for me in 1973. When I surrendered my heart to Christ, life began there, and it's eternal life. So I have hope to the end. But not only is our, our, it's essential, the truth is the truth, we're living that truth. He said if the resurrection isn't true, we're just living a lie. Just going through religious motions traditional activities, singing songs, but what, to what end, if it's a lie? To no end. It's purposeless. But you know, we have the truth in Christ Jesus. 1 John 4, 6 says, we are of God, and he that knows God will hear us, and he that is not of God doesn't really hear us. Hereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. What's he saying? Because Jesus is risen from the dead, you can have life. And when you have that life, you walk now into a whole new realm of living called truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. When you surrender your heart to him, he comes into your life. His Holy Spirit literally inhabits, the Bible says, your body. This body becomes the living temple, a vessel of God. He lives in me, and now I have truth in my life. But it's not just something I uh, agree with. It's something I live. First John talks about it. You know, if we, die, if, if we say we're believers, if we say we're Christians, and yet we reject the truth, he says, you're, you're just living a lie. He said, not only are you living a lie, you're telling people you're a believer, but your life's not right with God. He said, you're telling a lie. So if, you're, if, you're, if you say it's true, but yet you don't embrace it, if you say it's true, but you've not chosen it, if you say it's true, but you're living your own life, he says, you're not only living a lie, you're telling a lie. But for those who embrace the gospel, who trust the Lord with their life, who surrender their hearts to him, you are not only you know, telling the truth when you speak, you're living the truth. But that's the glorious nature of the resurrected life of Jesus. It's the basis of it. It's truth. And here's the thing about it. When you do hear something that's not the truth, because he now lives in you as the living truth, your ears pick up on it. You see things and you understand things differently than what you did before. That's why when I really gave my life to Christ, I saw things that I really hadn't seen before. Before, I said, well, you know, all, you know, all religions just kind of there. All, everybody's got these religions. It's a lot, many paths to the, to the one God that's there. But when I gave my life to Christ, began to understand the word of God, I realized that's not true. There's not many paths. The Bible says there's just one path, you know, and there's just one Lord, and there's just one resurrected Savior. And Jesus said, you know, if any man's going to come to the Father, it's going to be through me. 
No man comes to the Father but by me. I am the way. I am the truth. I am the, not one of many truths, not many, one of many ways. I, I'm the only way. And so if you're sitting there and say, well, there's no real big difference between Mormonism and, you know, Muslims and Jehovah Witness and Baptists and Catholics, and there's no big difference between all the different religions of the world and Judaism, you know, it's just, you know, like there's this one big happy God up there, and he's just sprinkled out all these little ways, and, you know, hopefully you'll pick up on the right one of the many. Well, if there's are many that are right, there's tell you that many more that are wrong. So how are you going to know which is which? In the wisdom of God, he has given to man one clear avenue. So there can be no mistakes and no second guessing. Now, it maybe doesn't make sense to you, but it makes perfect sense to me. So here's God. He gives us truth. And he is the truth. And then he gives us the capacity to know that truth. John 8, 32. And you shall know the truth. You discover the truth, the living truth, Jesus. Then you shall be made free. Free from what? Well, one passage talks about free from pain, sorrow, the fear of death. And we'll talk about that in just a moment because Jesus even conquered death. We're also, he says, if we, Jesus isn't risen, we're still, we're still bondage to our sins. But if he is risen, then we're no longer slaves to our sin. One thing about the nature of sin, I shared our first service this morning, is there's two qualities about a person who hasn't surrendered their heart to Christ. There's two things about him the Bible makes very clear and Jesus makes very clear. One is, if you don't know Christ, the Bible says that you're blind. Oh yeah, you can see physically. I mean, you can perceive what's in front of you, but you don't have spiritual eyes. You don't really see things the way they're supposed to be. You don't really see the world as the way God wants you to see it. You don't see eternity the way God wants you to see it. You don't see the scriptures the way God wants you to see it. You're blind. But another capacity of a person who doesn't know the Lord Jesus, really an incapacity, is that they're in bondage. There's, there, there, there's captivity. All right? That's why Jesus said, you'll know the truth and the truth shall set you free. We're in bondage. We say, what am I in bondage to? We're in bondage to sin. The Bible says all men have been born into sin. And sin is what captivates us. Sin is what separates us. Sin is what keeps us from knowing God. Sin is what keeps us in, in miserable pain. The wages of sin is death. death, all right? That's where sin ultimately leads. So if Jesus isn't risen, if he hasn't conquered death, then I'm still in bondage to my sin. But he says here, Jesus is risen from the dead, so I'm not, a, I'm not in bondage to it anymore. I, I am a free person in Christ Jesus, John 8, 36. If the Son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Now, if I'm free from sin, that means I don't have to fear death. If I'm free from sin, it means I can have a relationship with God. If I'm free from sin, then I can know what real living is all about. If I'm free from sin, I don't have to go back to the same traps and addictions and bondage that I used to live in. I'm free because Jesus is risen from the dead. You can be free. But the avenue is ultimately through this risen Savior and the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. One of my favorite passages in all the New Testament is Romans 6, 14. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you are not under the law, but you're under grace. What's God saying here? God's saying, I have set you free. You don't have to follow a code to be right with me. You don't have to keep a code to be right with me. You need to love me with all your heart, your mind, soul, and strength. You know what? If I love him with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength, that's, I'm not bound by that stuff. I'm living a new life under the grace of God, under the freedom of God, under the blessings of God, because I've discovered what it means to walk in grace. So many people there are so bound up to their sin. And here's what I mean by that. They think that they're going to get to heaven and have a relationship with God by being a good person. If I just do everything right, if I just don't you know, say the wrong things and if I do say the right things and if I don't do the bad things and I do the right things, and, you know, and it's like walking a tightrope. The problem is there is that we're all bound by sin. Sooner or later, you're going to fall off that rope. And you're going to continue to fall off that rope. No matter how much you struggle every day, you say, well, I hope I can just please God today and everything can be right. No, God is now pleased because of a risen Savior. And I can live my life from that perspective now, of freedom in Christ. And you say, what if you do sin? If you do sin, man, I want you to know the Spirit lives in me. And I'm grieved and I'm hurt by it. And I'm aware of it. Nobody has to get up and tell me I'm, I'm wrong. I know in my heart I'm wrong, all right? Because he lives in me. But the beauty of that is that he died on the cross to pay for all my sins. That's why the Bible promises you in 1 John 1 that if, hey, if you confess your sins, you come to the Father, God's faithful and he's just to forgive you of your sins. Why? Because the price has been paid. So he'll forgive you of your sins and cleanse you. Now, I, I wish there was some point in this present life, folks, where we just never sinned anymore. 
But as long as we're in this world, and as long as we have this stuff called the flesh on us, all right, until, until we become incorruptible, we're going to be prone to that. This is the world, the world, the flesh, the devil. But listen, we don't go back to where we were, and we don't go to the depths that we used to go to. We're ever increasing our walk and rising higher in our walk with him. Because we're no longer slaves, we can come back and be freed by the Lord Jesus. The th fifth thing he said was, you know, if the resurrection is not true, all those people, <laughs> they're miserable. They've died. They didn't go to heaven. They don't walk with God. There's no, there's no life for them. But since the resurrection is true, the saints who've gone on before us, those people who died in Christ, they are in the presence of God right now, and they're rejoicing in the presence of God, and they're enjoying the beauties of heaven right now where they are in this moment. While we're here, there's another reality that's taking place, a spiritual realm in a place called heaven where God who is spirit, the Father is there, the Son is there, the Holy Spirit is there also, as well as He indwells our life. But in heaven, there are those angels and the myriads of angels and all those saints who've gone before since the day one of time, who put their faith in God and who look forward to God to, in grace, forgive them and cleanse them. They are now in his presence. And praise God, there's going to come a day when you and I, if we aren't interrupted by the second coming of Jesus, which is another great prophetic, the next big prophetic event. The first one was Jesus coming, all right? And then the second one was him suffering for our sin. And the third one is his coming again. Now, if we don't make it to that time alive, then I've got some news for you. You don't want to miss this point. You're all going to die. You'd probably rather have a painted egg about now. <laughs> You're going to die, all right? The scripture says it's better to go into the house of a funeral, the house of mourning, than it is to the party. Why? Because it's in those times when you visit the funeral that you realize all of a sudden life is short, life is trampled. It's not forever. This life is fleeting, and every one of us from the day we draw our first breath of life in the dying process. We're going to die. And here's the thing about it. If Christ isn't risen, when you die, for lack of better terminology, it's going to be hell to pay going to be bad. But for those who know Christ and put their faith in him, he has conquered the grave, death, and hell, and risen from the dead, proving his authority over all those things. He's, he's bigger than death. And so he comes on the scene. We put our faith in him. And if I die before he comes again, the Bible makes it very clear, I will go to be in the presence of the Lord. Second Corinthians says this, and we are confident, I say, and willing Rather, to be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. What's he say? The moment a believer dies, somebody who loves Christ dies, there's an instantaneous moment where they part the veil of death without any problem whatsoever, without any pain whatsoever, and they walk in the very presence of a holy God. And right now, those souls are in God's presence rejoicing. Now, if you die without Christ, your soul is not going to be in the presence of God rejoicing. Scripture makes it clear the other, only other alternative is a place called hell. I didn't write this book. I just speak it. He wrote it. I got a problem with that. Well, you take it up with him. Amen. John 14 says, Jesus is speaking, and this is the last words of Jesus to his disciples as they're on the way to Gethsemane. And he said, listen, I'm going to go prepare a place for you. He said, and where I go, you know, I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you to myself that where I am, you may be there also. You see, what was happening here, they just had the, 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 the Passover, remember, and the institution of the Lord's Supper, and as they're leaving, Jesus said, don't be sorrowful, because, you know, this is a terrible moment. I, I mean, all of a sudden, from Passover, this is happy, memorable moment, they're having the Passover meal, and then Jesus kind of changes the whole atmosphere when he takes that, that cup off the table and that bread off the table, and says, this is my body, and this is my blood given for you. And now the whole atmosphere changes in that upper room. It's almost to the point of despair, and Jesus said, hey, it's going to be dark and difficult, but listen, I'm going to go, I'm getting the house ready. <laughs> I'm going to go prepare a place for you, and I'm going to come again and receive it to myself, that where I am, you may be also. The ultimate goal, folks, is not for God to make you rich, fat, and happy right here, all right? The ultimate goal is for you to spend eternity in fellowship with God. Amen. Now, I know that's not the message being preached today. Now, here's the thing about it. In between this moment where I die, I want to live it for the glory of God. But when I do die, I'll be introduced in the very presence of God. 
So I'm not afraid to die. I mean, take a boatload today if I'm on it, no big deal. Why? It's all taken care of. There's no sting in it. There's no pain in it. There's no fear of it. I'm not afraid to die. But there's not a lot of people in the culture that can say that. In fact, Jesus, the Bible tells us, he said he came to take away the fear of death, which has held men in captivity all their lives. So when Jesus rose from the dead, God accepted his sacrifice. Now we can have a relationship. Now your body goes into the earth. Your soul goes to heaven. There's coming a day when you will experience a resurrection as well as Jesus was the first fruits of that resurrection, which means this. He said, if this is not true, we're to be pitied. But since it is true, we should be envied. This is what scripture says in 1 Corinthians 15, verses 20 through 27. But Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. Can I get an amen? Yes, the first fruits of those who, who have fallen asleep. For since death came through a man, that was Adam, the resurrection of the dead comes also through a man, that's Jesus. For in Adam, all die. So in Christ, all will be made alive. But each in his own turn. Christ was the first fruits, that first resurrection. But when he comes, those who belong to him, the end will come when he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion and all authority and all power. Now, without going into a lecture here, you know, the end times are going to come. This tribulation is poured down on the earth. God does some tremendous things where wrath is being poured down on the earth. Israel is being saved through the process. We know what the scripture teaches and prophecy about that. But the Bible talks about, you know, the, right before that tribulation, and I believe it's where it occurs. Some believe it's after and middle some. I believe it's right prior to the tribulation begins is the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. And it's really, it's, it's it's in two stages. First coming of, that two, of this second coming. The first stage is when the Bible says he appears in the air like a thief in the night. All right? When he appears in the air like a thief in the night, there's going to be this event that takes place. And it's going to take place so fast, nobody's going to be able to see it. It's in, a, it's in the twinkling of an eye. Just a, a nanosecond is what that is, basically. You just, you just can't measure it. It is so tiny. But in that moment of time, there's this, this, this event that happens where the Lord comes and the souls of the saints come with him and they're in the air. All right? And then it says, at that moment, when the trump sounds, the graves are going to open up. How'd you like to be a gravekeeper out here somewhere on that day? They're going to open up, and the bodies of those saints who've gone before, whose souls are waiting, those bodies are going to be raised up, all right? And then it says, after they're raised up, and they're the Lord, then it says, then we too also, then we shall be caught up, and we shall be with the Lord as well. That's if you make it alive to that point in history, all right? Some of us will, maybe. Some of us won't. But anyway... No matter which it is, if you're a believer, you don't have to worry, all right? If you're in Christ, you're with him already. Your body comes up, and now there's this reunion. What is happening here? It's the resurrection. Amen. This is a picture. Jesus is the first fruits. Then there's going to be this global resurrection around the globe of every child of God who's died in Christ. Just a glorious celebration day. They come up, then those who are, are remaining that love the Lord, that are alive, says, then they shall be caught up with the Lord as well. Now, you tell me who's to be pitied and who's to be envied. All those people who kind of maybe look down their nose at you and think, that poor person, look, and they believe that Jesus stuff. They're going to be looking for you. Can you tell me a little more? <laughs> you have one of those gospel tracts still? <laughs> Can I read that? Of course, it'll be too late in that moment in time. Let me share one more scripture here as we close this out about being envied. 1 Corinthians 51 says this. Behold, I show you a mystery. We're not all going to die or sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye. At the last trump, the trumpet will sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be what? We shall be changed. Now, you have to understand, God is holy. He, there can be no unholiness in the presence of the heavenly places because he's holy, and so he, he has to change us, all right? We have to be made fit for heaven if these bodies are going to come in. So when he raises us, the scripture says, this corruptible, this dying flesh puts on incorruption, and the mortal puts on immortality. So when <clears throat> this corruptible shall put on incorruption, the mortal shall put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where's your sting? O grave, where's your victory? Who for so many who thought the grave is the end of it, the graveyard is the end of it, death is the end of it, for us, it's not so. We have nothing but hope as believers. 
lie before us. Nothing but the best. Now, I know some of you may be facing things in your life. You say, oh, this, this, this seems insurmountable. I've got this big problem. There's this big issue in my life. <laughs> There's nothing but good news for you. Even though you may walk through the valley of the shadow of death, Jesus has already pursued that path, taken that path, and it was not a shadow of death for him. It was the valley of death. And he went through that for you, and he conquered death. And he conquered the grave. He conquered Satan. He conquered hell. He conquered the penalty that was against every one of us because of our own individual sins. He dealt with it, and he paid for it, and he came out of it. And this resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ is proof undeniable that Jesus is all, has all authority and all dominion has been given unto him. And now he gives us life. So let me ask you again, who is it that should be pitied? Who is it whose life is most miserable? It's not those who place their faith in Jesus Christ. Let me close with this illustration. Some of you remember Hurricane Andrew. Some of you weren't born during Hurricane Andrew, but 20 plus years ago in Florida, I remember seeing pictures on the TV of aerial views. They flew over parts of southern Florida. Some of you may remember just devastated. Homes were just completely collapsed and destroyed houses and buildings. Massive, massive damage everywhere you saw, which is, it was horrendous. But the news reporter found one man in his front yard who was cleaning up his yard. His house was the only house still standing in the community. Every home had been destroyed but his. This is a true story. And they were quite amused as he's out there raking his yard and getting the debris out of his yard and cleaning things up. They went to him and they asked him, he said, you know, <coughs> this, is, this is incredible. Uh, how is it, you know, uh, it, your house is still standing? Amidst all this devastation. He said, well, let me tell you, <coughs> I built this home myself. And when I built it, I built it according to the Florida State Code. The state code said that if I would build my house according to this standard, that my house would withstand hurricane force winds. And so when it called for two by six trusses, I did that. When it called for the clips to be put under the trusses and attached to certain parts of the house, the framing was done. I did it all according to code. And I did it, and apparently it worked. I guess everybody else in the neighborhood didn't use the same book, didn't use the same code. Well, of course, after Hurricane Andrew, you, do, you may remember during that time, that was a big deal because so many builders built thousands of homes that weren't according to code. And when the hurricane came through, it was discovered. Well, there's another storm coming, folks. Much bigger than Hurricane Andrew. The Bible talks about the end of days and the crisis of the end of days. And if you do not know the Lord, it says that we're to be, we're, be, we're to be pitied because we're miserable. But if we do know the Lord, whatever assails us, our house can stand. Because God is bigger still. And God is greater than all the things that can come against our lives. And you say, well, the other things, listen, the Bible says even the worst things in our life, God will turn them into good. May not seem good in the moment. All things work together for good. But you have to build according to code. Jesus put it like this. Two men built a house. One man built his house on the sand. One built his house on the rock. All right? And the winds came, and they will. And the floods came, and the rains came. In other words, they're tested from every level, from above, from the sides, from beneath. And the test of life do come against us. He said, so when the house that was built on sand had to come up against the pressures of the world around it, it collapsed because it, there's no foundation. But the house that was built on the rock, when the flood, the wind, the rains came, what happened? It stood, it endured because it had a foundation that it was standing on. Now here's what Jesus said. You want to know what house built on the rock represents? He said, it represents any person who hears my word and believes it. The code. <laughs> the truth. The Word of God. What are you building your life on? Are you building your life just on whatever you think's right, what you want, what your plans are, what your vision is for life, what, you, what you'd like to see happen? Where does God come into the equation of your life? Is, is He at the center of it? Is He the focus of your heart and life? Because the Bible says He can put it together the right way. And if you follow Him, then, when the winds come, they will come. When the trials come, they will come. When the storms come, they do come. But it won't collapse you. You're going to make it through. You're going to be all right. You'll be safe and saved because you've built your house on a solid foundation. That's the Word of God. And it's not just enough just to hear it, to know about it, 
There comes a part in your life when you choose to build your life according to his, his purposes. And your life is founded in Jesus Christ. The wise man builds his house upon the rock. I'll conclude with this. What are you building your house on? There's a song we used to sing. I serve a risen Savior. He's in the world today. I know that he is living, no matter what men may say. The song goes on to say, how do you know he lives? The chorus responds, he lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me. He lives, he lives, salvation to him. You ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Built on the rock. A foundation. Your heart becomes his home. That's where the foundation starts. And if you've never done that, and thank God you're in a place today that will give you an opportunity to do that. They're right there where you are. The course of your life can change. The Bible calls that repentance. It literally, in the Greek language, means a change of mind. But it goes beyond that for the believer because with this change of mind, it says, no longer am I putting myself first. I'm surrendering to Christ and His will for my life, His Lordship over my life, His direction for my life. At that point, the Spirit of God will move in your heart and life. And repentance becomes not only a change of mind, it's a change of mind because Jesus moves in that produces a change of character, a change of direction in your life. Surrender to Him. Surrender to Him. It's not a prayer you can pray. There's not beads you can count. There's not a mantra you can chant. It's a yielded will to the will of God. And that point, when Christ comes in, you have a foundation to build your life on. If that's never happened, right here in this room, just open and say, Lord God, come into my life. This day, from this day forward, I surrender. My life will be built on you. And watch what God does in your life. You'll see that your life will not be miserable or to be pitied. It will become enviable, as a matter of fact. Maybe you're a Christian. And you're here today and this message just reminds you of things that maybe you've been trying to put off because you're not right with the Lord in some areas of your heart. And conviction comes. When the Word of God is preached, the Holy Spirit starts taking that Word and stirring up your heart, and you're uncomfortable, and you're uneasy, and you feel maybe like somebody's in your business, and, you know, or stepping on your toes, or whatever it might be. That's the Holy Spirit of God trying to draw you back to the place of grace. There's no way you can work your way back to that. There's no way you can do penance for that. It's grace. God says, once you come, lay those sins before me today. I'll wash you clean because the price has already been paid for them. Would you stand with your heads bowed? Leave your spell.